take a moment to take in what is behind me. Usually I only see this in the pictures that get shown to me at the end of the talk, once we head back to the monastery. Very professional, don't you think? All of this. Exquisite is the word I have for this. Very professional. You've got to wonder why it is that people put in the time and effort to do something like that. I mean, this kind of professionalism would normally be put in for something like a, a wedding, maybe a high-profile event of some sort. And usually these sort of things, they don't come cheap, do they? You've got to it cost an arm and a leg for something like this. But you've got to think why it is that people put in so much time and effort. I don't know whether it is one person, two people, or all of you getting together to do and organize all of this. But whoever gets involved, even by a mere word of appreciation, all of that is an offering to the Buddha Sasana. And that is why people do all that. It is because of the Buddha Sasana. It is not because of me as a Swami Nuhansi. It wouldn't matter who the Swami Nuhansi was, whoever the Swami Nuhansi who comes in, into this place and preaches the Dhamma to you, as people like yourselves begin to assimilate the Dhamma and it starts making an impact in your lives, it comes a point where we begin to feel, ladies and gentlemen, that no matter what we do, it's just not enough. How much is enough for what the Buddha has done for you? Go on, tell me. <laughs> for all the sacrifice that he made, or many countless yawns. Because remember, this is a Supreme Buddha we speak of. It is not someone who determines that I must aspire to Nibbana and free myself from suffering. It is not that. Perhaps a Rahatan Mahansi might be of that caliber. Maybe a Pacheka Buddha? Possibly. But a Sammasam Buddha is not like that. When he begins to make a resolve, once he starts doing the Mano Pranidhana, and then the Vachi Pranidhana, and the Kai Pranidhana, these are the resolutions that a Buddha makes, or a Buddha aspirant, a Bodhisattva makes, to go on to become a Supreme Buddha, the way he resolves this, the way he makes his determination is, through my hard work and determination, may I, this is what the, this is what the Bodhisattva thinks, on his way to becoming a Buddha, may I be able to help liberate all sentient beings from sansara, and then me. That is his resolution. So how much do you think is enough for what the Buddha has done for us? You know, when you do, how much do you feel you've done enough? So as a monk, when do you think I'm going to be satisfied with what I have done for the Buddha Sasana? After how many sermons do you think? Am I going to feel, I think that's enough. <laughs> After how many times of me coming to Rajagiri do you think it's going, I'm going to feel like it's, it's enough, that's enough. I've done enough. After speaking to how many of you do you think I'm going to feel that, you know what, that's enough. A hundred people, two hundred people, three hundred people, that's enough. And in just the same way, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to appreciate that all the effort that goes into all doing all this in that light. You know, people who do this kind of thing, all of this, you know, right from the individuals who bring in the refreshments, those who have invited you to come along and be here today, the gentleman who always comes and sets up the microphone and who makes sure that you're all comfortable when you get here. It's not an easy task that he does. He doesn't get to spend his time here during the Dhamma talk, I always talk about him from time to time. Did you know that he wasn't even born to a Buddhist family? I only got to learn that when I invited him to the 
Samma Samadhi program at the monastery. And when I was going to pass the invitation over to him, and someone told me, I don't believe that he's Buddhist by faith, so he may or may not come to the program. And then the thought that occurred to me is, my goodness, do you see the devotion with which he comes and offers himself and his time? I remember the day when the principal and the chairman of this organization, the school, I met him at the school, and then the same gentleman was there on that day, and I remember him speaking to the gentleman and saying, the Swami Nuances are going to come and start doing this program here, please look after them. It was he who walked us into this room, on the very first day we came here, showed us around. They said that this, this hall was set up for an examination. And he walked us around and showed us the whole place. And then he promised, yes, sir, I will do. And from that day on to this day, he's always been here. He comes along, sets up the place, makes sure that Swami Nuance is comfortable, sets the microphone up, all that. And then he doesn't keep himself here. He goes out to make sure that your vehicles are safe. And that you can listen to the Dhamma sermons without any interruptions. That's his duty. He does that on behalf of the Buddha Sasana. Not for this Swami Nuance. He doesn't know me personally. See, it matters not at the end of the day whether you know how great the recipient of what you're offering is or not. If you offer something to the Supreme Buddha, it matters not whether you know that it is the Supreme Buddha you offer it to or not. Because the greatness of virtue, the greatness of value that adds, that is, that is granted by the recipient is this. All you need to know is you're making this offering selflessly, you're making this offering for something good. And how much that good is, is determined by the receiving party. If you kill someone, do you need to know that it's your mother or your father before it becomes a heinous sin? Do you need to know? You needn't. If you kill someone and it is your mother, even without you knowing it, that still is one of the Panchanantri Papa Karma. You needn't know that it's your mother you're killing. It's just the intention to kill is enough on your side. That's why the Buddha says intention is everything. Volition is your karma. So in the same way, remember last week I mentioned to you, as you still have your parents with you, treat them with devotion. Love them, respect them, and do everything in your power to look after them. Even if you didn't know they were your mother and father, it still adds a lot to your life. So then what about when you do know? It magnifies. Because a merit done with wisdom, a merit done with knowledge, is a much greater merit than one done without. Because on your side, you magnify the intensity with which you apply yourself. And therefore the merit power that comes out of that is humongous. And the same thing is going on here, ladies and gentlemen, don't you see? All of this is an offering to the Buddha Sasana. So when we do these sermons on a Sunday morning, I always want you to reflect upon that. It is not just the Swami Nuhansas arriving here who represent the Buddha Sasana. Everything that goes on here, everything. From setting down the chairs or setting out the chairs, Someone must come around before you do, perhaps early in the morning, and sweep this place so that it's ready for you when, you when you walk in. Someone, I'm sure, will go and check the toilets and make sure that they're all clean and tidy. Maybe there are janitors who come in on Sunday morning just for this program to make sure that this venue is set up for all that. But when you walk in, all you have to do is go and use the washrooms without even thought about the, about the fact that someone is actually coming to do all that before you walked in. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that sometimes we don't even know. But I remind you about this from time to time so that you can rejoice in them. 
in rejoicing in them we can earn as much merits as the people who do them. Without fail, every week we've been coming here, there's been a venue available for us. You've never had to be concerned about the safety of your vehicles, have you? Anyone? No, never. You've never, have to be con you've never had to be concerned about whether you're going to have a comfortable place to sit and relax and listen to the talk and make use of the facilities when you need to? Never. How much did you pay to be here? How much is a ticket? These things are priceless because it is all done on behalf of the Buddha Sasana. You are also here because of the Buddha Sasana. You're here and you brought someone with you because of the Buddha Sasana. I'm sure there must be people among you who offer a lift to someone who lives close by, maybe someone who is unable to come here because they don't have a vehicle of their own. So I'm sure there are those among you who offer a lift. All done on behalf of the Buddha Sasana. The camera records all this, so someone offered a camera. I didn't bring it when I came into the Sasana. This gets recorded, it gets put online. And once it's online, how long is it going to be there for? Hmm? For eternity. It's not like those days. What a pity it is that in the Buddha's era they didn't have video cameras. If they had them back then, do you think I'd be preaching to you right now? <laughs> I'd be sat where you are and we'd have a sermon up on screen. We'd be listening to him. Well, what a pity. But then there were the great Arahants. They were the video cameras of then. Evang me sutang ananda tero says. Thus have I heard. So unfortunately he was not a video camera, but he was an audio recorder. He recorded every word. Such was his memory. He could remember every word that was uttered by the Buddha, syllable for syllable. He regurgitated all of that when it was his time to do so. And the great Kashapatero. Sometimes we know, we don't give it enough thought, ladies and gentlemen, to think about the sacrifices that people have made so that today we have the Buddha Sasana. You know, it's the Buddha Sasana that I speak of here. It's not independence. Independence is a big thing. We celebrate independence every year, don't we? But this is something that goes beyond that. Independence Day is big for us because this is our nation, this is our country. But what about the Buddha Sasana? Who is the Buddha Sasana for? Sri Lankans? Indians? The Nepalese? Who is the Buddha Sasana for? <laughs> Just humans? No. What about the Devas? What about the Brahmas? All sentient beings, every mind that suffers, the only resort is the Buddha Sasana. Any other faith can help you perhaps reach to the heavens, but that's the, that's the extent of it. What happens after the heavens? There are no answers to such questions. But today we know that you, although you might end up in heaven, usually after a while, after your merits have run out, you're, you're back down, either here or it could be worse. That's what the Buddha has said. There are today beasts on four legs who used to be devas. Very powerful back then, but their merits ran out. This is the universal currency. It's not the money that you have in your pocket. The universal currency which is to be exchanged for any other goodness, any other comfort that you get in life, are the merits that we have all acquired and we continue to acquire. So from time to time I want you all to rejoice in all of the good that happens around here. Someone somewhere, we don't even know them by name because they're, it's not, they, they're not doing it to become popular. That's a wonderful thing. I don't know the person who brings the, the gilampasa. I don't know them by their name. I don't know who it is that offers the sandwiches but apparently you get one every day. I don't know them by their name. They've never come up to me and said, Swami Nansa, do you know? It is I who make, the, who make the sandwiches. Never have they done that. Why do you think they don't do that? Because it's not for fame or glory that they do it. Then what do they do it for? The 
Sambuddha Sasana. Sambuddha Sasana is synonymous with Nibbana. If there's no Nibbana, there's no Sambuddha Sasana. If there's no Sambuddha Sasana, there's no Nibbana. So they are synonymous. Nibbana is nothing other than freedom, happiness, unconditional happiness for all. And that is why they do it. If it's for unconditional happiness, someone does something, do they need to come up to me and say, Swami it is I who do, do it. Do they? No. But you might have, might have seen, sometimes in other places, other people, they're very keen to come and make themselves known. Swami did you know that it is I who offered the, these flowers? Do you know it is I who offered the, the robes? Do you know it is I who did the lights? A lot of places you go, they'll have their names printed on a plaque. Right? If a Buddha statue is offered, beneath that you'll have the name. If a Dhamma hall is built, next to it you'll have a plaque with their name on it. At our monastery, there are no names. None. Well, if you find one, it will simply say, Sri Gautama Sambuddha. <laughs> that is the only name you'll find. Some people often come and ask, who is the Vihar Adipati? Even he doesn't go by his name. That's why we call him Guru Andro. Because we are not here to leave our name. We are here to leave a legacy, not the name. The legacy is the Buddha Sasana. The path to liberation. What do you need more? My name or the message that I have to give to you? Which one, which one interests you more? Which one helps free you from suffering? Who I am or what I have to offer you? Which one? Tell me. Which one helps free you from suffering? Which one brings you great happiness and joy? Who I am or what I have to offer you? Well, there you go then. If it's what I have to offer you that helps you free yourself from suffering, then what does it matter who I am? Then what does it matter who you are? By your name. But your deeds, this is what leaves a legacy. Your actions, this is what leads a legacy. So all of this effort, ladies and gentlemen, collectively, you know, when we all come together, we are one. Take the Sunday morning sermons, for instance. Who does this? Give me one name if you can. Who makes the Sunday mornings happen? Who? Hmm? Who? Swami Nuhansi? Who? The person who does the decorations? The person who puts the water up here? The gentleman who invites Swami Nuhansi to deliver the sermon? Who? You can't give a name. You can't put a name to it. But when we all come together, now we have a result. This also helps with your understanding of what a manifestation is. Because the Sunday morning sermons are a manifestation. It's not the who's, it's the what's that happen. No doers, just the done. Remember? Now if you can get our thinking to align with that, there are no doers, just what is done. If you can get our thinking to align with that, ladies and gentlemen, there itself is the answer. The reason we all suffer is because we always want to attribute actions to a doer. We feel that there has to be an individual, a self who does something, and a self who doesn't do something. Now, if it's an action that we desire, we like them. If it's an action that we don't like, we hate them. But if you can see past that, through our insight and through our wisdom, if you can see past that and simply see good and bad, not who does it and who doesn't, then we realize that good we need more of. So we act on that behalf, we lobby for that, we advocate that. And then there is bad, if there's bad happening in the world, then we try and stop that from happening. We try and speak against that so that everyone realizes that bad is harmful just for the person who does it or for everyone? It's for everyone. And who is good, good for? Just the person who does it or for everyone? For everyone. There you go then. This is the coming together of everyone's effort. Therefore, it makes no sense to put a name next to it. That's why no one says, it is I who do, who do it. And that really speaks volumes about your understanding 
and the cause to which you have committed yourselves. That is the Buddha Sasana. If you want a name, the only name that I can offer is the Lord Buddha. But beyond that, there is no name. Because we are here for a Namaskara. A Namaskara is the Nama Askara. We are here to eradicate the name and leave just the actions, just the legacy. So then before we begin, let us do that Namaskar. Let us make our resolve. Let us bring our palms together in veneration of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. The purpose that we are all here for. That sublime goal and that ambition. That inspiration that has brought us all here today. And that has helped us to see beyond our individual selves and see the greater good that we are all here to achieve. So let us chant the Namaskara, seek refuge in the Noble Triple Gem, observe the precepts, and begin with today's proceedings. Namo Thassa Bhagavato Arhato Samma Sambuddhassa Namo Thassa Bhagavato Arhato Samma Sambuddhassa Namo Thassa Bhagavato Arhato Samma Sambuddhassa I have a video I want to show you. I'd like to show it to you right at the beginning. Because then it will help you to figure out the value of the Buddha Sasana. And what your purpose should be of being here and associating with the Buddha Sasana. There are seven wonders in this world, isn't there? You've all learned at school. We've all done that, the seven wonders. Name me a few. The Great Wall of China. It's a great wonder, isn't it? What a great wonder. I believe it is the only man-made structure that's visible to the moon. Well, it used to be, I don't know now. Maybe they can see the Burj Khalifa from the moon now, I don't know. Can they? The Taj Mahal, iconic, a great wonder. People gaze upon these structures, these man-made structures, and they wonder how, how or how could such a feat have been possible, don't they? That's why we call them wonders. It rouses wonder within us. We are so utterly impressed when we see them. So much so that sometimes our hearts skip a beat just at the sheer sight of it. The magnificence of these structures. When you see the Eiffel Tower, you look at that and gaze, wow, that's a wonder. And you look at the Leaning Tower and you wonder, how, 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 is, how is that possible? These are the questions that come to mind. How, how is that even possible? How come gravity doesn't do what it does to me, to that? Marvels. You're amazed by the seven wonders. Perhaps there are some in the audience who have visited each and every one of them. Maybe it has been or was or will be an ambition for some. Before I die, I have to go and see the seven wonders. Like the best movies to watch before you die. The Seven Wonders. But you know, our Swami Nuhan says at the monastery, having listened to the Dhamma, having contemplated on the Buddha's words, we began to wonder if there's something more than these wonders that we must consider today as the seven wonders of the world. Something that truly amazes us. 
something that really gets us thinking, wondering and pondering what is the purpose of us, of us being here in the first place. I'm going to show you a video clip which you're fortunate to be here today to watch because you will not be able to get, you will not be able to watch it on YouTube. Why? Well, you will see why in a moment. YouTube is, does not take very kindly to certain realities of this world. There are some truths that must be left unsaid. You know, like when, you run, when your child runs away having done drugs, oh, they elope, your daughter elopes. Which paper do you publish that on? Guru Handra always asks us this question. If your child runs away, your daughter runs away with a boy, which newspaper do you publish that in? You don't, right? So some truths must le be left untold. If your son's doing drugs, who do you go telling about it? But that's the truth. It's an ugly, 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 bitter truth. But you can hardly talk about it with anyone. There are some truths that the world out there, they're not prepared to accept. You know, like, death is not a nice topic, is it? But it's a reality that hits everyone. But it is said that in civil society, you know, it's not a, it's not a topic that comes up around the dinner table, does it? Unless, unless the dinner was, of course, organized on to, to commemorate someone's passing away, then such topics don't come up in discussion. Because people can't tolerate them. Cancer. These are not topics that people like to talk about. But these are the realities that we must all face. And we all live with the risk of getting one. All our lives. Until you die, can you be assured that you will not get a cancer? Until you are dead? No, none of us can watch for that. But none of us like to talk about it. It's hush-hush. In, the same, in a similar vein, there are some wonders that we see them as a wonder, but these are certain things that you will not be able to watch on YouTube because if they see this video on YouTube, they will, they will ban the whole channel and then you won't get to see any more sermons again. So I'll say this before I put it on. It'll come with a disclaimer. There may be some among you who will find this shocking. But whenever you find it shocking, please remind yourself that this is the shocking truth. It's okay if you choose to look away, it's fine. I'm not forcing you to watch any of this. It's okay for you to look away, but remember, this is the reality that awaits you. When the reality hits you, you're not going to be able to look away. Then you're just gonna to have to embrace it. So for now, you can look away. Just be aware that it's coming your way. Look away at your own peril. I feel that you're ready for it now. I wouldn't have brought this and showed it to you on the first day. Because on the second day, we would not have needed this venue anymore. <laughs> but now you've been coming along for some time, what, six, seven months now? Seven, eight, going eight? Something like that. You've been coming along for a while and you begin to realize that there is more to reality, there's more to existence than that meets the eye. And now you are dedicated and you've committed yourself to freeing yourself from suffering. I want to show you some parts, some aspects of suffering you may not have thought exist in this world some destinies, some fates that exist in this world for those who don't make the effort to do merits and free themselves from suffering by practicing the Dhamma. So this is not going to go on YouTube. So I'm sorry to any, anyone who thought that today's sermon, they can watch the entirety of it on YouTube. They will not be able to see the video. 
but the rest of it will be there. So well done you, well done on you for coming along today. Are you ready for it? Fasten your seat belts. And if you are ever in difficulty to breathe, please put your mask on before you put the one <laughs> next to you. So it comes with a disclaimer. Some of this might be a bit graphic. You might not be able to watch it. Some of you might scream. Not scream, don't scream. <laughs> but this is the reality. This is reality, this is the truth. As you watch this video, I want you to ask this one question. How fortunate you are today that you have come across the Sri Sambuddha Sasana. Whose story do you think that was? Hmm? What do you think? Just think about it. Now you see why that can't go on YouTube? This is the harsh reality that people will not want you to learn about. The Buddha knew what he was saying when he said, rare indeed it is to be born a human being. He doesn't just say things. He says it because he knows it. You've been born human. Look at yourselves, fully formed. You've got intelligence about you. But how many times did you die? How many times might have you been miscarried? But these things you don't remember now. If you believe that sansara was, is a reality, if you believe sansara is true, then that is the journey that you came on. Today you're here and you've forgotten all that. The time that we all spent in the four great hells, ladies and gentlemen, that is, I think, why we, it seems that we are so familiar. <laughs> We spent far, far more time in the four great hells together than we've ever done in the human, the human realm. Because time here is what, eight years, ninety at most? But time in the, in, the, in the four great hells is the same, but not in years, but in eons. Don't take my word for it. I'm sharing with you what the Buddha said. If this is false, then the Buddha was false. This is why when I see people who are not striving to attain their Nibbana, I, I feel, what a wonder. That is the world's greatest wonder. Having jumped through so many hoops, you know, if you believe any of what you saw right now, I may, let me ask you this question and answer, to me, answer this question honestly, but silently. Do you feel you're doing everything you need to do for yourselves today? To save yourselves from that? Are you happy with all the effort that you're making so far to free yourselves from all that? You know, you wake up in the morning, you get your children ready, you get your husband ready, you get your wife ready, you send them off to work, you send them off to school, you pack yourself a lunch, you get to work, you work then from 8 to 5, 6 in the evening. Some of you will work longer hours because, because you can, because you want to, because they want you to. Some of you will even work weekends. 
Some of you work twenty, you know, all, seven days of the week. But none of that is going to free you from any of this. Then when you get a free day, you go on a trip. When you have a free evening, you sit down, you put your feet up and you watch a film. When you feel like it, you go out with your family and have a meal. You go to a restaurant, enjoy yourself, go on a world tour, a trip once in a while. I have nothing against you doing that. And I don't speak out of envy, I hope you know that. Now Swami Nwase can't do any of those things, that's why he's making reference to this. No. Swami Nwase sees that that is the destiny that awaits you. That's the fate that awaits you. So I ask you this question, are you, do you honestly feel that you're doing enough to free yourself from this? Yes, I'm a monk and you're a lay person, but we both have the same test at the end of the day. It doesn't seem fair. I know it doesn't seem fair. But I can't change the rules of the game. As a bhikkhu, I have committed my entire life to this course, to freeing myself from suffering. You come here on a Sunday morning. Not one-seventh, one-fourteenth of your week you spend with the Dhamma. One-fourteenth of your week. What about the other time? You keep on doing what people have said is what you're supposed to do. But no one told you that this is your reality. This is what awaits you. These are not things that get discussed around the dinner table. These are not things that your friends will talk about you when you invite them for tea. But this is the reality. Don't you want to save your children from this? Don't you want to save yourselves from this? Your poor mother, she's on her bed. She's pulling her last breaths. Maybe she has another three weeks, maybe a month, a year. Most of your mothers will probably have maybe another five years, maybe ten at most, not any longer. For all the things that she has done for you as a mother, this is what awaits her if she doesn't become a sotapanna. <laughs> Looking after her, feeding her, washing her, giving her shelter, giving her love is all good for you, but what does it do for her? You being a good child to her only consumes her merits, that's all. Think about this. When you are good children to your mothers, your fathers, they are simply consuming their merits. It is because of their own merits they were lucky enough and fortunate enough and meritorious enough to have good children like you. But what does it do for them? A few years ago, a few generations ago, at least when people were older, they began to be more interested in the Dhamma, to work on their salvation. But nowadays, even they have ways and means to be preoccupied. Now you have Netflix at home, you don't need to bring your parents to the temple. Not even on a poya day must you take your mother or father to the temple. And even they can't because you are too busy. They can't go, they have to be driven. They are too weak to drive, but you're busy. But this is what awaits them. They were a whisker shy from being born in the four great hells. What good if it, would, it, would it have been if you were born an animal? Have you seen the stray dogs on the roads? Hmm? Have you seen the cows walking up and down? You know, sometimes they get struck, they get hit by moving traffic. And then after that, no one cares. No one cares to stop. Because everyone's busy. Now who do they share their pity with? Who do they share their, their agony with? Who's there to look after them? No one. What if that happens to you? Do you feel just because you've done more good than bad, you're free from all of this? It is like potluck. At the moment of your death, you don't know what karma comes to, you, comes to your mind. <clears throat> and there's evidence of that from history.
Unless you become a South Afghan, ladies and gentlemen, there is no refuge. There's no getting out of this. A few weeks ago, I showed you how some people break their backs working just to earn a living. You are fortunate enough not to have to be there. Today, you know, you have comfortable ways and means in which you can earn a living for yourselves. You don't struggle to make ends meet. Good. But the price that you have had to pay for that is you've had to sacrifice every waking moment of your life to some business, some enterprise, some, ad some venture that you're involved in that you hardly have any time to work on your salvation. I'm appealing to the good sense that I believe is within you. Wake up to reality. Many people who thought that they lived holy lives, they died and they're nowhere to be seen in the human world. Not in the Deva worlds, not in the Brahma worlds. It is not I who said that being born human is rare. Choose to ignore anything I have said, but it is the Buddha who has said, being born human is such a rare occurrence. And even when you're born human, what if you're born human like that? Did you see that young, that, that baby, the child, who was born with some, some sort of condition and you know, how are they going to live their lives? That is still human. You've jumped one hurdle, but for how long? And the way the world is going, people are getting, people are ending up with unwanted pregnancies far more than they used to back then. What if your next birth, you are born, you are, you are born into uh, the womb of a mother for whom it's an unexpected pregnancy? What do you think they're going to do to you? Those days it was so taboo, no one spoke about it. And people feared, so people feared God. But now people don't believe in God. There are more atheists in this world than people who fear God. Put Buddhism to a side, put karma to a side, put Nibbana to a side, at least believe in God. At least believe in God. Believe that there's a superpower out there, a superior power out there who, who, who judges every action that you take. And then based on that, you will be dealt either good or bad. At least believe in that. No, but people have forgotten all that. Because today they have gone, taken refuge in technology. They've taken refuge in science. Someone got me to listen to a, a podcast done quite recently. And they were saying, show me Swami Nansi, just listen to this for a second. I said, what is it about? Listen to it, Swami Nansi, he said. A very popular figure, media figure. So they were arguing for incest. They were saying, what's so wrong about it? Two consenting adults. As long as they, no, neither, you know, they're not going to get pregnant, and so to end up with a deformed baby, what's the problem? They're arguing for these things now. And apparently in some countries it's legal. My problem is not with incest. Because karma is karma is karma, that's all. My problem is this is where the world is heading. What are you doing? Again, I ask you this question. Do you feel you are doing enough? Are you doing this to make me happy? Do you come here on a Sunday to, make, to please me? Who are you trying to please? Who are you trying to free? Because this is the fate that awaits you. Our young children don't know any of this because they don't teach this for science. They don't teach this for geography. They probably don't even teach this for philosophy. But what good is it, ladies and gentlemen, if you make a professor 
out of a young child over the course of what, 10, 20, 50, 25, 30 years, and yet after they are dead, they go back to the, into the animal realm and be born as a preta? What's the point of having become a, becoming a professor? What's the point of landing on the moon if when you die and you're born again, you're in the four great hells? What's the point? I agree, we need an education. Without an education, you can't survive. But that is what an education should be for. It's like food. What is food for? Survival. That's what food is for, sustenance. What is a shelter for? Sustenance, to survive. What are clothes for? For survival. Just like medicine, medicine is for survival. When your doctor says take one tablet each evening, do you take two? Do you? Why not? Tell me, why don't you? When the doctor says take one tablet, one tablet of metformin, Diabetes? Yes, take one tablet every evening. Do you take two for good measure? Why? Why don't you take two? What's going to happen to you if you do? You're going to collapse. You won't live another day. So if that is how you treat medicine, you only use it for sustenance, why do you treat food differently? Food's for the body. The body needs food, not the mind. The Dhamma is the food for the mind. Just as food heals the body, what heals the mind? More food. Delicious food. Tasty food. Yummy food. Is that what heals the mind? No. Look at what delicious food has done to you. Today you'll tell me you're overweight. Obesity is a big thing. A lot of young people, they, have to, they, they suffer from this. Because they couldn't stop at what the body needs. But I'm, what I'm trying to explain to you, ladies and gentlemen, is look at what people put themselves through. Because this, they don't get to hear. They don't show this stuff on TV. Because it would not be a popular channel. It would not be high in the ratings. When you watch this, when I had already warned you beforehand, I heard a few tss and ha's. That's okay. That's perfectly fine. You're not going to have this on mainstream TV, are you? People will not want to watch this kind of thing. It's shocking. So what will people do if they see this on TV? Quickly change the channel to watch what? Some girls dancing. And if they're fully covered from head to toe, switch the channel again to see somewhere there, half naked, that's even better. That stuff is okay on YouTube. Not having a go at YouTube, by the way. YouTube is there to serve the needs of the people. When you go on YouTube, you get, a, you get an idea, it gives you an idea as to what kind of people live in this world today. <laughs> You can't flame YouTube for that. It's like, look at the leaders of the nation and you can get an idea of what the people are like. It's always like that. Because it is by nature, the leader is a representative of the people that they lead. If people are holy, if people are virtuous, your leader is going to inevitably be virtuous. Because an unvirtuous leader cannot lead a virtuous people. It doesn't work like that. Nature intervenes always and resets that. So if you say that our, our leader is, uh, is unwholesome, our leader is unvirtuous, then you can say the same about the people being led. Who's the leader of a gang of criminals? A saint? How does that happen? Because people want someone like them to lead them. And the same, the same principle applies everywhere. You will not see this stuff on TV because that is not the kind of stuff that people want today. People just want something to scratch their rash of karma. Something that pleases the senses. 
That's all people want. They don't realize that having been born with the senses itself is a miracle. So once again I ask you, do you think you are doing enough to free yourselves? If you're happy with what you're doing and you're content with that, carry on. If not, then I urge you, it's time to start to make a few choices, a few choices a little bit differently to what you've always been doing. I'm trying to show you the future that awaits you, ladies and gentlemen. This is your future, my future. When I saw my future there, I knew something had to change. I was no longer going to be a people pleaser. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be a crowd pleaser from then on. Enough was enough. When I thought my task was to become popular, my task was to become someone who everyone liked, that is not what I wanted anymore. My friends wanted me to go, go with them, watch, you know, watch films, go to the cinema, go to the restaurants, eat, have fun, throw a party. This is what my friends wanted to do. And if I did them, I was popular. They accepted me as part of their clique. But if this is what awaits me, no thank you. Let them do what they want to do. But I have a different purpose in life now. So I speak to not all of you as a group, I speak to each of you individually right now. I speak to each and every one of you individually. Hand on heart, answer this question, do you feel you're doing enough to free yourself from sansara? If you feel you are, hats off to you. If you feel you're not, I ask you, when are you going to start? It is so unfair, I admit, that I, as a monk, and you as a layperson, we both get the same test at the end. You are not exempt from the four great hells just because you didn't have time to practice the Dhamma. Sorry. You, do, it's, you can't put that forward as an extenuating circumstance. You know, when you go to and do an exam, they give you spare time some extra time if maybe the language in which that the exam is, non, is in is not, your, is not your mother tongue, you get some extra time to do that. If you have a handicap, they give you some extra time. Hmm? Maybe you might even be able to get yourself some extra time by explaining to them that you know, maybe you've been ill, you've had a loss in the family, you can argue your case and buy yourself some extra time. But in this test, there are no extenuating circumstances, none accepted. Because when we go to do that test, although we've lived our lives, me as a monk and you as a layperson, before, the, before we enter the exam hall, they strip us naked. That's what they do. They strip us naked. So that once you step into the doors, can they tell which one's a monk, which one's a layperson? Can they? They can't. They strip us naked. Now we must both, we must both, go, both go sit on that, sit on the chairs and take our exams. And they ask you this one question, are you a Sotapanna? Do you understand Anicca? If the answer is yes, right, walk this way, the four great hells are not for you. If the answer is no, then the, question, the next question comes. As if by random, they pick one deed that you've done in your lifetime. And not just this lifetime, it can be previous lifetimes as well. They take one deed from your, from, your, from your lifetime in sansara. Have you always been holy in this life? Is there nothing in your life that you can say, Swami Nuhansa, I have not done a single bad thing in my life? Anyone in the audience? Not even I can put my hand up to that. There is none here who can put their hand up and say, I have not done a single thing in my life which I regret and which I don't fear will come back to me at the moment of my death. You've heard of King Ashoka. He was an emperor back then. He caused a great massacre, killed many hundreds of thousands of people. But later on he realized that he had a task to do as a Buddhist. 
when he on one occasion encountered a, a Buddhist monk and he realized the errors in his ways. And then from that point forward, he dedicated his life to, to proliferating the Buddha Sasana, but he himself did not become a Sotapanna. It is said that he built 84,000 chaityas, pagodas, stupas, 84,000 of them, one for each discourse delivered by the Buddha. But at the moment of his death, someone was fanning him. One of his servants was fanning him. Those days they used to have, used to have electric fans, they had things like this. They were fanning him. And just before his last breath, by mistake, as this lady, the servant was fanning him, the fan hit him, hit his body. And you know what, he happened? what happened to him? He got angry. Just once, he got angry. And with that anger, he passed away. Do you know where he was born? For the 84,000 stupas that he built, he must have been born in the heavens, right? Aha, uh -huh, that's not how it works. I can't change the rules of the game. It's not all the things you've done that matter. It's what comes to you at the moment of your death that matters. So then you'll ask me, Swami Nuhan, sir, how do, we, how do we change what comes to us in the moment of our death? And then you'll tell me, Swami Nuhan, sir, I remember, I remember, I remember, when my old mother, when she was frail and she was in her bed, we used to play Pirit. So that she would continue to listen, listen to the Pirit as, as she passed away. Or we used to have a, a Buddhist channel on TV so that she would watch the Dhamma sermons as she, as she passed away. It doesn't count. It, it's good, it helps, but doesn't count. Because here's what happens. In the moment of your death, all your senses shut down. Your sense of hearing is the last one to go, but it also goes. And then there is one split moment, one split second, we are your all alone and you and your mind, that's it. In other words, your mind. At that point, it's not what you see, not what you hear, not what you feel. Your external stimuli are all blocked. This is the moment just before death. At that point, you are all by yourself. Nothing that anyone says out there, you can hear. Nothing that anyone shows you out there, can you see. So even if the Buddha was stood next to you, at that point you are disconnected. You are all by yourself. And then, you and your memory, because that is all the mind can access on its own, the mind needs the five senses to access whatever is out there, but on its own the mind can access its memory. Some deed that you have done will come to you at that point. Some deed. Even if you have done many good deeds, if there's one bad deed that you had done, it is quite possible that that will come back to you. A lot of people, they think that they do more good than bad. When in, you know, in true reality, folks, you actually do more bad than good because it's easier to do the bad things than it is to do the good things, is it not? When someone takes something that belongs to you, is it easier to forgive them and let them keep it or is it easier to go and tell them off and try and somehow get it back from them? Which one comes to you naturally? If someone steps on your toe, what's the easier thing to do? Supateva. Tell me what comes to you naturally? That's what comes to you naturally. That is a reaction, right? There's an audible reaction there. That's what comes to you naturally. If that is the audible reaction, don't you think there's a mental reaction having gone on already? Because the sound that just came out of you only represents the mental thinking that had already gone on inside. And we are talking about many billions of chittas in a single instance, in a single second. So anger has already arisen within you. And then you might come to your senses and go, oh, no, 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 I better not say something because I'm a good Buddhist, so I, have to, I just have to say it's okay. Say, say, say sorry, say, say it's okay. That comes to you second.
because we are still practicing. But then he, what does becoming a Sotapanna help you do? So as a Sotapanna, will you not be remembered of some of the bad deeds you've done in your past? You will. It's also possible. Even as a Sotapanna, you could be remembered. It, you, it might come to memory, some bad deeds you've done in the past. But here's how a Sotapanna thinks. It is their thinking that is different to one who's a Prutakjana. Why is a Prutakjana? Is someone who thinks the world is Nitya, Sukha and Atta. In other words, their purpose of life is to make themselves happy at any cost. They suffer from Loba. They suffer from Dvesha and they suffer from Moha. So conflict and desire are the two main ways in which they deal with the world out there. So these are the two options that they have. But a Sotapanna, even if something bad that they've done comes to them in the moment of their death, the Dhamma that they have understood will come to their protection. That's why they say Dhammo Have Rakhati Dhammachari. The Dhamma that you have understood will come to your safeguard. At that point, the Dhamma will take forefront and it will prevent you from having thoughts of anger even if the memory comes to you. A memory of something, something bad you've done or someone having done something bad to you, it will prevent you from being angry. If someone, if you are remembered, if you are reminded of, say, a sensual act that you've done, maybe, maybe you, maybe adultery, was your thing. No one knows. It's a secret. But a secret is never a secret from whom? The one who does it. It's never a secret. So all of those secrets are in your memory. And sometimes, you know, you, you try and get them off your mind, but they keep coming back to you. You know what I'm talking about. If you've ever cheated on your, on your spouse, on anniversary day, it always comes back. <laughs> Always comes back. Comes back to haunt. These things, they hardly go away. Always comes back. So in the moment, at the moment of your death, this is another thought that can come back to you. You cheated. You slept with another man's wife. Or another woman's husband. Thought comes to you. But if you are a Sotapanna, in that moment, you see that in a very different light. You only think of it in a way that does not arouse within you lust and desire. You are remembered of this occasion, just like looking at a bunch of flowers. Just imagine if you could look at these flowers but not think that they're beautiful. You see the flowers, but you don't see the beauty within them because the beauty is not in them. In the same way, a fragment of your, of your, of your memory will come to you. Something from your memory will come to you, but your response to it is going to be different. So lust, desirous thoughts, those things don't arise in that moment. Because your understanding as a Sotapanna comes to safeguard you, comes to your safeguard. This is why it is so important to become a Sotapanna, because we've, never, no, we've not lived our lives like saints. And I'm only talking about the things we've done in this life. Even if you choose to ignore the things you've done in your previous lives because you can't remember, and besides there's nothing you can do about them now, what is done is done. But somehow or other, you did something that gave you life as a human being in this birth. That much you were able to do and you have done. But who knows, ladies and gentlemen, what awaits us in the moment of our death? Who knows? So even if you don't believe in the four great hells, but you believe in God, even if you don't believe in the Buddha, but you believe in God, I tell you, God will judge you because there's no secret you can keep from him. Karma will judge you. There's no secret you can keep from karma. And when judgment day comes, we are all alone and nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. That is why it is so utterly important to commit as much of your lives as you possibly can to the purpose of becoming a Sotapanna. You heard those last words on the video. To be born human is, a, is, is very rare indeed. 
to come across an era in which a Buddha was born is so rare indeed, ladies and gentlemen, because without a Buddha, how can you ever become a Sotapanna? To listen to the Dhamma is so rare indeed. When did you actually start listening to the Dhamma? In your lives? The Dhamma that helps you to attain Nibbana, when did you start listening to it and actually become serious about it? All your lives? You have an answer, right? When did you start? Only the last maybe six months for some. Maybe a year for, for others. Maybe two years, five years at most. So the vast majority of your life you did spending what? Doing what? Raga, Desha and Moha. Are you going to tell me that when you're dead you're going to be born a Deva? You spend 30, 40, 50 years of your life doing Raga, Desha and Moha, nothing more than that. Yes, you've done the odd meritorious deed, but you know, even preparing for the meritorious deed, you know, sometimes you get together as a family and you take alms to the Swami Nuhanse. Yeah, you do a, maybe you do a, a yearly alms giving at the, at, at, at the temple. Let's say that is what you've been doing regularly as, as a meritorious deed. When you go and offer the, the alms to the Swami Nuhanse, if the Swami Nuhanse doesn't have what you want, you want to offer now, so you're walking in queue, you want to serve what you have, you have brought. And Swami Nuhanse says, no thank you. The Lokohamdra says, no thank you. You go to the next Hamdra, the next Hamdra says, no thank you. None of them take what you have offered. How are you going to feel at that time? How did you feel, I ask you? Take a trip down memory lane. At that point, all the joy and the happiness that you, have, you had in your heart in preparing for that arms giving, what happened to it? It was like a deflated balloon. That's what you felt like. And then you start asking yourself, no, why did I bother? I woke up early in the morning and put in all the hard work to prepare this and now none of these monks actually even took anything, at least they could have eaten little of it. Now you start blaming who? The Swami nuances. The very people that you went to make the offering to, now you start telling them off. What do you think you're doing at that time? Earning merits? See? Even when you prepare yourself to do a meritorious deed, if you are mindful enough, ladies and gentlemen, you will spot what I'm telling you. You do more demerits than merits. It's like the price that you have to pay to do the merit. Even at home, you know, people get together then, you know, so you invite your families, you invite your relations, right? Maybe you and your neighbors to come and cook the meal. Right? Someone bumps into you. Again, you go what? See, you've got together to do a meritorious deed. But how many instances of demerit do you actually do in preparation, in, 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 as you plan and prepare for the, for the meritorious deed? And then if you go into the temple, right, and you see that the temple is, you know, nicely built, they have tiled floors and, you know, it's all very nice, then you go, oh, they have, they have a lot. Why do they need our charity? Now again you start passing judgment, you start criticizing the temple, you start criticizing the monks, you start criticizing the Buddha, you start criticizing the whole sasana. Actually, when you come, come to think about it, at the end of an almsgiving, you have for for every merit you have earned, you've earned about another hundred demerits. Because of your lack of understanding. Ignorantly we do this. Because we are not mindful, we do this. We don't think about it. You know, anger is not just when you hit someone. Every moment you feel a sense of conflict inside you. All of that is anger, that is dvesha. Every moment of conflict is a moment of dvesha. And these are unmeritorious deeds that happen in the mind. You don't actually have to express yourself. See, there are three categories of unmeritorious deeds, aren't there? There are those that you do with your body, like stealing, killing, and so on, and sexual misconduct. This, you need the involvement of your body. Then there are those you do with speech, lying, Slander, yeah? These are things you, you can only do, and harsh, harsh speech. These are things you require your body, your mind to do. Then there are those that you only do with your mind. You don't need to speak a word, you don't need to move an arm or a limb, nothing. 
One of those things is anger. The moment you are angry, you've already done the unmeritorious deed. It has already happened. The karma has already happened and therefore the vipaka has already been generated. How do you stop yourself from being angry? For all the times you've complimented your parents, how many times have you told them off? Shouted at them even. And even if you didn't shout at them, the times you got angry with them, mentally. For all the times you've been nice to your husband, your wife, you've been good to her or him, right? How many times have you actually told them off? Shouted at them, sworn at them, hurt their feelings intentionally. Just think about it, ladies and gentlemen, just, let's just be honest. If you take your lifetime, right, and I ask you this question, have you done more good deeds or bad deeds? How much time do you need to answer this question? How many times did you take away that pen that you had at the office, you took it home to give it to your children? Good deed or bad deed? Bad deed. Every time you throw a wrapper on the floor, you buy a toffee or chocolate, something from the, from the shop, you put it in your mouth but you put the wrapper on the, on the ground. What do you think that is? That is again a demeritorious deed. Because you're defiling. You're defiling something that doesn't belong to you. You're taking away an opportunity for someone to be happy. Because when something's clean, something's tidy, it, it, uh, it rouses in people pleasant thoughts. But if you steal that opportunity from them, now you've taken something that belongs to the people. Someone's going to have to pay a cleaner. This is tax money, has to be spent on cleaning that because you dropped it on the floor. How many cigarettes butts did you throw when you were a smoker? And if you still are. Each time you did one of those things, that was a demeritorious deed. So I ask you again, what have you done more of? Good deeds or bad deeds? And so you think when you're dead, you'll be born in the heavens. Why or oh why then, if your, if your children would come up to you and say, Father, I think that you've done more good deeds than bad deeds, so when you are dead, we are not going to give the Haddha Sadhana. We are not going to do the Thumma Sadhana. We are not going to do the alms giving on your behalf and transfer merits to you because you've done plenty of good deeds yourself, haven't you? Your children come and ask you. I ask you the question, as parents, hand on heart, can you tell your children? Yeah, so be it. If you don't want to give that, it's, it's okay. I've done enough good, meets, good merits myself. So why do you do that for your parents then? When your parents are gone, you do the Tumma Sadhana, the Haddha Sadhana, the, and the yearly Dana and so on. You still transfer merits to them, right? In the hope that if they have been born somewhere unwholesome, May these merits help them to be born in good places. Because you still have this fear. You know, you know some of what your parents did. Some good things, some bad things. But everyone has a secret. Everyone has many secrets. These secrets, only they and karma know. So what I showed you today is the fate that awaits 99% of everyone who dies. Being born human is a very rare occurrence indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Don't take this lightly. Please don't take this lightly. Whatever life you have left within you, I urge you to use it wisely. Because after you're dead, there is nothing we can do about it. Even if you're born human, if you are born deaf, if you're born blind, if you're born without arms and limbs, then that life is going to be incredibly difficult for you. If you're born with a congenital disease which cannot be healed, then that life is going to be incredibly difficult for you. What if you're born with Down syndrome? 
Have you not seen children like that? Yes, we try and do everything we can to help them, but they are beyond our help. I, as a Swami Nuhansa, can hardly do anything for them. I have seen parents who have, who, have, who, have to, who have to put up with such children. Yes, I'm sure the mother, the father, they love that child just as much as they would any other child. But if they were given the choice, if they were given the choice, they would have changed it. So there is something about the child that they don't like. But now it's too late. But what if you end, in the, end up in that situation? Now don't ask me to explain this to you, but take it at face value for now. These are some of the things that I'm really weary about mentioning in these sermons because then people start asking questions, how come, how come, how come? The answers will come to you later on. You know those people who just drink themselves crazy? And some people who intoxicate themselves to the point where they lose their sanity and they behave like crazy people. What, they, what they're giving up voluntarily is their sanity. You know, as human beings, we can conduct ourselves in a sane manner, right? We have our wits about us, we are intelligent, we can, we can make choices about the actions we do. But when you are drunk, you lose that sense, don't you? These are one of the deeds that leads to you being born with Down syndrome. Because if you don't value your ability to think straight, your ability to take actions based on your decisions and think carefully, think rightly and make the right decisions and act mindfully, these are one of the things, one of the causes that can lead you to be born like that. Because if you give up this when you have it, you won't get it back. And then you have to live, up, live with that for the rest of your life. You can choose to ignore that, it's fine. If you find it's hard to stomach what I've just said, you can choose to ignore that. And I'm sure there'll be those who will have a big, they will throw a big fuss about what I have just said. I say, how dare you say something like that? Are you saying that my child was a drunkard in his previous life? Only because they feel insulted. My intention is not to insult. My, ins my intention is to free you from insult. But then, you've got to call a spade a spade, right? So we have to be very mindful, ladies and gentlemen, about the actions that we take, because every action has a consequence. Every action has a consequence. So whose story was that once again? Your story. My story. Our story. So whose job it is, is it, whose job is it to free yourselves from that unfortunate, misfortunate destiny? Whose job? My job? To save you? Is it? No, it's your job to save yourselves. Everyone to himself or herself in this game. And one last time I ask you this question. Do you feel you're doing enough? to save yourselves from the misery that awaits. I only speak to you out of compassion. I honestly don't feel you're doing enough. Forgive me for saying this. You're doing enough to become a professional. In your career, in your line of work, I'm sure you will reach the pinnacle of it. For that, I'm sure you're doing enough. And hats off. You're doing enough to become very educated and you're doing the same for your children. That you're doing very well and I appreciate that. Well done. You're doing enough to go on to become maybe the richest man in the world or at least one of the top 100 richest, richest people in the world, maybe the country. You're doing enough. Yes, well done. But what are you doing to save yourself from that misery? How much of your life have you invested in that cause? Every, every penny you earn, you're going to leave it to somebody else on the day you go, right? You know, when you die, all they'll do 
is they'll keep the amount and change the name of the account holder. That's all they do. That's what they do. It's like the termites. They build a mound. They work hard day and night. They work together as an army and they build a mound. And then once they do, the termites are out and the serpent creeps in. And now it becomes a serpent's house, not the termites. It's just like that. You work hard, you build up a business. And when you're dead, they'll take your name out and put someone's name, someone else's name on it. Nothing remains for you. <laughs> I'm speaking on your behalf. Do you understand that? Do you agree I'm speaking on your behalf here? Because no one else seems to be doing that. Everyone wants to get something from you. Everyone wants to get something from you. Who's here to give something to you? Your children want something from you. Yes. Don't they? From head to toe, they wanted to get something from you. They took your milk from you. They took your blood, sweat and tears from you. They took your money from you. They took your property from you. They took your, they took your name from you. They took your glory, your fame from you. They got a place in society thanks to you. And now they're okay. What did they give back to you? You live hopeful that one day, you know, when you're old, they'll look after you. What else? You tell me, well, Swami Nasa, they, you know, they were very respectable children. They grew up, they got a good education and they brought me fame. They brought me glory. And today I'm happy to be their, their father. They, I'm happy to be their mother. Is that what you came into this world for? Has that saved you from the four great hells? Because your children had a good education, you are free from the hell, four hells. Is it? Your, father, your child's going to become a doctor. He's the best doctor in the, in, the, in the land. Are you free from the four great hells? Are you free from being born with deformities? Are you? Are you free from being born a dog? Are you? No, but you invested your whole life teaching them. Teach them, yes. That is your duty now as a parent. But what I'm telling you, what I'm reminding you is, that is not your purpose. That's not your purpose. When you hire a home to live in, you, 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 you get a place out for rent. You pay your rent, because that is a duty that you have to do. You pay your rent. But that is not your purpose, is it? You rent a place, let's say you, were, you work in the city. So now you rent, a, you rent a home and then you live there. Do you, did you rent so you could pay rent? That's my question to you. Do you rent a place so you can pay rent to somebody? Or did you rent a place so that you can go there, stay there, live there and go and go about and do your work, you know, get, you, get to work quicker, right, in, 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 a, in a shorter period of time? And, and live closer to the amenities that you need and so on. But at the end of the month, you have to pay the rent. You pay the rent because you have to pay the rent, not because you want to pay the rent. In the same way, fulfilling your duties and obligations you have to do because you have to do it. I want you to start thinking of children in the same way. I, I don't know whether I'm making an unreasonable request. There may be parents here who are now looking at me like, I'm going to kill you if I can get my hands on you, Swami you know, sir. You're probably thinking, don't you understand how much I am devoted to my, my children? I live and breathe on their behalf. I have lived my whole life for my children. Yes, 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 I know. And that is exactly why I'm speaking to you in this way. What your children go on to become has no bearing on where you're going to go when you're dead. So who's going to speak on your behalf is what I'm asking you. I'm not suggesting for one moment, don't fulfill your duties and responsibilities to them. Do. I mean, we have what? More than a hundred children at the monastery. 
they're not my children, they're your children. There are those among you who have given up your children to us so that we, they can have a better upbringing, so that they can be taught the morals and the values and the virtues of life rather than just an education. Thirty more are joining us in two weeks' time. I think by that, by that point we'll have about 150 young children at the monastery. We give them a good education. We do. But we know that that is not the be-all and end-all of their life. So I'm not for a moment then suggesting that you must not teach your children because if I was suggesting that, I wouldn't do that, would I? I practice what I preach. So I give them, we give them a good education, but that is not all we do. After all is said and done, I understand that only what I have done remains for me. What I have done for myself is for me to take with me. That's it. The Buddha preaches this. He says to the monks, because bear this in mind, he says, attadattam parattena, bahuna pina kape, attadattam abhinyaya, so that the paustosia, he says, what he means by this is, during your, dis during your time as a monk, you will be doing things on behalf of other people. But don't make that the be-all and end-all of your life. You will do things to help your devotees. You will be doing things to help society. But don't make that the be-all and end-all of your life, because remember, when you have to take that exam, you will be stripped naked. At that point, I'm not going to be able to say, but, 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 I went to Rajagiri every Sunday. <laughs> I've done so many sermons. Can you not give me a chance? No. The question will be, have you become a Sotapanna? I say, but, 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 no, 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 but, just, have you become a Sotapanna? Yes or no? It's a very small box, so you can't write a description in it. You can only put a Y or an N, one letter. A very small box. You can't write so and so and so and so, this because of this, because of that. Mm, it doesn't fit. Only one letter, either yes or no. If it's a yes, then they say, right, please walk past the doors to the four great hills, because that is not for you. If it's a no, then they open the big fat book. Right, let's go through this then, shall we? Let's look at all the bad deeds you've done and find a fitting place for you. Let's be honest with all of us. We've done more bad than we have done good. Face the facts, ladies and gentlemen. Don't be shy, don't be embarrassed to admit that because if you do, it's like going to the doctor and the doctor asks what's wrong with you because you're embarrassed, you say nothing. How can the doctor treat you then? There are three people you shouldn't lie to. Your doctor, your lawyer and your teacher. Lie to them, and who's being lied to? Oneself. They don't even have wife in that, you see? So even that apparently is okay, but these three people you mustn't lie to. So teacher is who you have here right now. Of the three, teacher is who you have here right now. So don't be embarrassed of that past what I'm asking you to do is do something about that past. You can't change the deed that has already been done. All you can do is change the present so that at the moment of your death, you are not left alone. The Dhamma is there with you. If you want the Dhamma to be stood by you, to help you, to guard you, to protect you, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to do it now. Now. If you are going to tell me, Swami Nasa, we are still too busy, I haven't retired yet, you know. If you are going to come here and tell me that, Swami Nasa, I haven't retired yet, I still have another five years to go. After that, after that, I will start listening to the Dhamma. Believe you me, after that you will have your grandchildren to look after. 
you will not have time for the Dhamma. Do you not remember? First you say, after I'm retired, I will come and practice the Dhamma. Then you say, after my children, I will do that. My grandchildren, some might even have their great-grandchildren. There's never an end to this. There's, there's a, there are a hundred and more reasons as to why and how you can procrastinate your Nibbana. But the inevitable fate, that doesn't go away. Are you doing enough? You are very good professionals, yes. You are good teachers, yes. You are doctors, yes. Engineers, yes. Lawyers, yes. Scientists, yes. Businessmen and women, yes. Entrepreneurs, yes. Politicians, yes. Leaders, yes. Yes, 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 yes. What about working on yourself and working towards your salvation? Because they don't ask you what profession you were in at that point. They only ask you, are you a Sotapanna or not? And it doesn't matter whether you're a Buddhist or you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, you're a Hindu, you're an atheist, you're non-religious, you're a skeptic, you're a scientist, doesn't matter. Are you a Sotapanna? That's the question they ask. It's not like Christians get dealt one way and Buddhists get dealt another way. It's not like Muslims get dealt one way and the Hindus one way and the Muslims and the Christians one way. No, it doesn't get dealt like that. We are all dealt the same way. We all get painted with the same brush and served with the same spoon. In that way, it seems to be, it's very fair. It's very fair. The karmic judicial system is very fair. Because there, you can't escape based on who you know. Sometimes with the law, I don't know, I'm probably going to be contempt of <laughs> God by saying something like this. No, not the law, not the law. <laughs> In some places, right, you can get by because of who you know. But where the karma and vipaka is concerned, you can't, you can't do that. It doesn't matter who you know, who you don't know. It's what you've done and what you haven't done. That's all. So let us make sure that we take on the Dhamma. So you have a friend in your last moment. You know your husband's not going to be with you, right? Ladies, do you think your husband's going to be with you in that last moment? They can stand by you, maybe. They can hold your hand, maybe. But remember, in that last moment, all your senses are going to be shut down and you are going to be isolated. You're going to be in solitude. You won't even know that your husband is stood next to you. No one. In that moment, you can only have one friend. One friend alone. And that is the Dhamma. I want you all to have the Dhamma by your side so that you are never left alone. And for that, you have to start making friends with the Dhamma now. You know, the Dhamma is a funny kind of guy. It takes a while to make friends with him. <laughs> takes a while. You can't just, you know, just before the day of your death, you know, go see the Dhamma and say, hey, I'm dying tomorrow, do you mind coming around? <laughs> they don't do like that. It takes a while for you to get to know them. But once you've built that relationship, they never, they never go away. They're always there. This is the friend indeed. Because they're always there when you need them. The Dhamma is the friend indeed. They never betray you. Every other friend will betray you. You know, a lot of you have lots of friends. Aren't you ever in any doubt, even the slightest doubt, that one day they might betray me? When you need them, they may not be there. Is there, is there a single human being on this earth, on this planet that you can say, no Swami Nansa, that person, they'll always be with me no matter what. The funny thing is you can't even say that about your husband or your wife. 
Because even those relationships, they are conditional. <laughs> when the conditions are right, the relationship will survive. Once the conditions don't exist, the relationship falls apart. Isn't that why people get divorced? Because even a marriage is a conditional relationship. What about mothers and fathers? Children, even they are conditional relationships. There are some parents who will completely disavow their children. There are some fathers, I, I, I know, who've completely given up on their children because they say, Swami Nasa, I told him not to, he started doing drugs. Now, we have completely disavowed him. He's not part of the family anymore. We don't talk to him, we have, we have severed all relationships with him. I don't consider him to be my child anymore. If you would come home, I would chase him away. I would bring the police on him. There are some fathers who have come up to me and said that, see, this is a father-son relationship. Only lasts as long as the conditions last. Again, conditional. So if even that sort of relationship is, is also conditional, then every relationship in this world is a conditional relationship. So every friend you have, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying they're bad. You just need to understand the na their nature, that's all. All things in this world are conditional. All things. Only your understanding of the Dhamma, once you've understood it, it's always going to be there with you. Your understanding of the Dhamma is you becoming a Sotapanna. Once you have become a Sotapanna, that never goes. It always stays. Even after you're dead and you're reborn, the understanding of the, that, that level you have achieved as a Sotapanna stays with you. You may not remember what you learned. You may not remember the Dhamma that you learned to become a Sotapanna. But your achievement of having reached the fruit of Sotapanna stays with you. Because becoming Sotapanna is merely your perspective on life, on all things in this world. So even if you're born as a Sotapanna, but you don't remember any of the things, only the Dhamma you've learned, you may not remember the words Anichaduk and Anatta. You may not remember the word Buddha. But you look at these flowers, you'll see the arrangement. And there'll be something in your mind that says, isn't this just an arrangement? You may not have the words to describe it. Because you have not come across this word called manifestation to describe it. But you look at it and you go, isn't this just, I don't know, something about it tells me that this is not a unit. This is a collection. You'll have an instinct about you. And through that you will continue your practice. That is why the Buddha says once you become a Sotapanna, you no longer need a teacher by your side to take you from Sotapanna to Sakrudagami to Anagami and Anarahat. Now your path can be progressed without the help of a teacher. If a teacher is present, they can help make it happen sooner for you. If a teacher is not present, you can still walk alone because you have seen the destination. Without seeing the destination, how can you go on any journey? Just imagine you're going on, you're going on a journey you've never been before. But you can't see the destination yet. Say you're starting here. This is your destination. It's where you need to get to. But there are many barriers. So, you know, you could, if, if you walked without a guide, you could get lost because you could end up going this way. You could end up going that way and many other ways. So you need a teacher. But if your teacher walks with you, To this point, if your teacher walks with you, with you to this point, now you see the destination. From here on, you no longer need a guide because you have seen the destination. A Sotapanna is someone who has seen what Nibbana is. Once you have seen your destination, no matter what other barriers and blockages are there in your way, once you have seen the destination, you can now walk on your own. They, might, they may encourage you if they are always with you. They might inspire you. They might ask you to hasten your journey. They might support you, making the journey quicker. But you no longer need one. 
That is why becoming a Sotapanna is so crucial, ladies and gentlemen, because as the Buddha said, Kalyanamitta Sampatti, association with the Noble One is a very rare occurrence indeed, because this is a Kalyanamitta. A Kalyanamitta is someone who shows you what Nibbana is. Once they have shown you what Nibbana is, you no longer are reliant on the Kalyanamitta themselves. Now you are on your own. You can do it on your own. But let me ask you this question. Today we talk about Nibbana. We talk about unconditional happiness. When did you first hear these words? At age 5? 10? 15? 20? 25? 30? Just think about it. 30, 40, 45, 50 sometimes years of your life you spent without even realizing that there was such a thing called unconditional happiness. Now there might have been some among, among you in the audience who might have heard of something called Nibbana but someone told you, well, now it's beyond our reach, we have to wait for the Maitri Buddha to come along and then when he comes along, we can then come together, listen to his preaching and then save ourselves. I can see a few nods in the audience. Thank you. It is true. I've also listened to that gobbledygook. People have said that. The Maitri Buddha will come one day and then he will show us what Nibbana is and then because the Buddha Sasana is no longer potent enough. The Gautama Buddha Sasana is over. People used to say, not so. Not so. We still have merits. We still have enough luck and good fortune. The Gautam Buddha Sasana is still viable. It can still produce Sotapannas. It still can. It is still ripe. The tree still bears fruit. So there's no need to consider the fruit, the, the tree, no longer able to bear fruit and walk away. So walk towards the tree and you'll still see fruit hanging. Pluck it. Eat it. Enjoy the fruit. All you need is to understand the Dhamma. And you must have seen in the clip, there are many times we were born Buddhists, but we hadn't come across the true teaching. There are a lot of things that get done in the name of Buddhism today around the world. You might have heard there was a gatha that was sung in tune. What was it? Etapi Buddha Jayamang. That one, right? Yes. See, today, discourses that the Buddha gave for people to understand the truth about this world are now used as songs and to be sung for entertainment. Look at what has happened to us. They are sung in rhythm. They are sung. The Buddha comes into this world to teach us that there is no such thing as a song. In the Dhamma you must realize that. That melody, this, this you know, this, this pleasure that we seek from our sight, our sound and so on, these things are not present in the objects out there. These are all creations of our own mind. So therefore, this pleasure is not something we can expect from the outside world. But these very words today, they are sung as songs. If the Buddha were here today, I mean back then he forbade this. He laid down rules. He said, my Dhamma should not be sung as songs. He said, because if you do that, it will become incredibly difficult to attain Nibbana. But today, we seem to do that. Really nearly, without a care in the world. Sometimes people might even go and ask Swami Nuhansis to do that. I mean, just take a Kavibana for instance. 
This is not me criticizing what the Swami Nuance is doing. I'm, I'm, I'm just asking you to think about this open-mindedly. You all have heard Kabibana, right? When you listen to a Kabibana, do you tend to focus on the meaning or the tune and the rhythm and the music and the melody? That is where you tend to focus on. You listen to it and go, ah, oh, that was music to my ears. That is why it is sung in that manner, to help you to enjoy it. The Dhamma is not to enjoy in that way. The Dhamma is there to sharpen your sense of wisdom. So I'm not suggesting that the Kavibana should stop. If people want to do that, let them do that. But what I'm saying is, that is not what the Dhamma is for, in my opinion. The Dhamma should not be dealt and handled in that way. If when listening to a Kavibana, you, you start to enjoy it like a, you know, like a lullaby. Like a mother used to sing, you know, nursery rhymes to you. If that is what has become with the Dhamma, then attaining Nibbana is going to be so incredibly difficult. So when you find yourselves in these situations, just, you know, again, have your wits about you. Don't go with the flow. Don't do what everyone else does. Because then you'll also become very average. And the average bloke, the average guy, ends up in the four great hells. Because that's where most people end up. So I appeal to you, I urge you to start thinking outside, you know, what is normal today in the world out there. A lot of the things that are normal are not really normal. A lot of the things that people accept are what we should be doing with our lives is not what we should really be doing with our lives. We have become victims of that. What society has been feeding into our heads, we have just been gobbling all that up without any discernment of what is right or wrong. And so therefore suffering has become a part and parcel of our lives. So if you want to free yourselves from suffering, treat the Dhamma with respect, but treating with respect doesn't necessarily mean having a Tripitaka book at home and you know, offering flowers to it and Anunkuru and all that. That's not what I mean. To treat something with respect is to make that part of your life. That is what treating it with respect actually means. If you treat your parents with respect, then embody the values and the virtues that they have instilled within you or they have tried to. That is treating them with respect. If you, you know, go up to your teachers and ask them, I would like to treat you with respect. What do you think the teacher is going to tell you? Do as I say, right? That's what your teacher is going to tell you. So if you want to, treat, if you want to, if you want to treat the Buddha with respect, what do you think the Buddha is going to say? Do as I have taught you. How do you treat the Dhamma with respect? Do as the Dhamma says. How do you treat the Sangha with respect? Do as the Sangha says, so that you can become Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha within you. That is the greatest mark of respect that you can show. Yearn for the day where you are free from Sakkai Ditti. Throughout the last few talks, I've been trying to help you achieve that state. Sakkai Ditti is your thinking that what is considered a kaya or an aggregation is all one unit. As long as you have that view that this is one unit, that is Sakkai Ditti. Kaya is an aggregation. A collection is a kaya. That's why your bodies are called kaya. Because it's a body, isn't it? What's a body after all? A collection of things. A body of water is what? A collection of water. So your bodies are called bodies because it's a collection of blood and bones and vessels, your organs, tissues, right? All sorts of things, they're collected in one bundle. That's why it's called a body. This is a body of flowers. A building is a body of building materials. It's a body. That is what a kaya is. In the mind, the mind is also a kaya. And the, the aggregates there are Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara and Vijnana. This is the kaya that make up the mind. 
Sakkaya. To think that all of these five are to be considered together and it's one unit, it's one entity. When you think of the five aggregates as one entity, just as you feel that your husband is one entity, don't you? Don't you feel that he's one entity? Don't you feel your wife is an entity? So if you take a strand of hair off her head, don't you feel that that's your wife's hair? But it's no longer part of her body. But you still feel that it's her hair. Why is that? Because the hair came from her and it was all part of her. You see, that is what I'm talking to you about. You have a sense of belonging. You feel that everything about you belongs to you. In just the same way that, you know, this, this flowers. <clears throat> If I, if I took one flower out of this arrangement, you would, you would feel that that flower came out of this arrangement and that the flower belongs to that arrangement. Remember the pen? I take the cap off. What does this cap belong to? Which object does this cap belong to? This pen. You can't stop yourself from feeling that way. But this cap does not belong to this pen. It served as a cap, yes. You know, when they made this cap in the, in, the, in, the, in the factory and they made the barrel and the nib in the factory, they never knew and they never had an intention that this particular cap was going to go on this pen. But now that you bought it and now this is your pen, you feel that this cap belongs to this pen. So in fact, if I took this cap off and put it on another pen and took the cap from another pen and put it on this pen, what are you going to feel? You feel like I've swapped the caps, right? Why do you feel that way? That is because you consider this as a kaya, sakkaya. That is your ditti. That is a view, that is only a view. That is your sakkaya ditti. The day you break free from that, you are free from sakkaya ditti. All I'm talking about is the view, not the feeling that comes from within. The feeling that comes from within will go once you become an arahatan once. But the view, that will go when you become a sotapanna. In fact, the, the doing away with the view itself is your first step into sotapanna, into the stream. Vichikicca, silapada, paramasa, they all come as part of the package. I'll explain to you next week. How? When Sakkai Dipti happens, Vichikicca and Sila Bada Paramasa, these three cankers which keep you bound as a Prutagjana. Because it is when you dispel these three, Sakkaiditi, Vichikicca and Sila Bada Paramasa, you become a Sotapanna. One of the easiest parts to understand is the Sakkaiditi, and this is what I'm helping you to understand right now. You can't help but think that this cap belongs to this pen, right? That is your Sakkaiditi. This cap belongs to this pen. Why? Because all of this is one unit. This kaya, this aggregation, is a sat kaya. In other words, a unit, a body, the whole thing is a body, an entity. This entity-based thinking is sat kaya ditti. Do you understand that? This entity-based thinking is your Sakka Editti. See these beetle leaves that you have so nicely laid on this, on this tray. Don't all of them belong to this arrangement? Don't you feel that way? You feel that way, don't you? In fact, if I took one of these If I took this away, don't you feel like I've taken this from this? I'm not just talking about the action of taking this away and walking away with it. I'm talking about the sense of belonging that you have. You feel that this leaf belongs to this tray, this, this arrangement of leaves, this, the, the natural place where this should be here. So that's why when someone takes something that belongs to you, you say, hey, give me back, that's mine. In this world, there is nothing that is yours, except for your perception that it is yours. 
Is your husband yours? Hmm? Is your husband yours? If your husband's yours, then everyone should be able to pick that, pick up on that. If two people walk walk the street, right? Two people randomly, they know that one is the husband, one the other, the other is the wife, but only they know that. But no one else knows. Why is that? Say a couple, they're walking along the street, right? But they're approaching each other from different opposite directions. Each of them know that the other is their spouse, but nobody else does. Why is that? Exactly, because it's merely a perception. The husband is in the wife's mind, and the wife is in the husband's mind. They're not really out there. So these are only perceptions. And it is because of that perception you suffer. Suffering is all based in a perception. That is why once you rectify your perception, you, end up, you stop suffering. So what does Buddha Dhamma help you do? Rectify your perception. You don't need to change anything about the world. Let your wife be there, let your husband be there. You just got to stop thinking they're your wife. And you can still live with them. Now this might sound bizarre to you right now. How can you live with your wife when you stop thinking that she's your wife? <laughs> when you're asleep, right? say you're, you're dreaming. Now is your wife your wife? You, you're in a dream world, right? In your dream world, say you're a fairy. <laughs> okay? Now where's your wife? Where's your husband? But are you still not sleeping? She's, you know, he or she slept next to you on the bed. See, you're, you're, she, they're still there. But in your dream world, maybe you have someone else who's your wife. Maybe Aishwarya Rai is your wife. In the dream world. In the dream world, you know, you have all these fantasies. Because while you're in your dream, that is your perception. In your dream, you know, don't you, don't you cry? Don't you feel fear when something happens? Someone comes up to you, you know, with a sword or a knife in their hand, a dagger in their hand. Don't, don't you start screaming? Sometimes you, you are woken up, you know, because of your own screaming, right? Some people cry elephants uh, in, in the country, in a countryside where there are a lot of elephants. My, my father used to, used to do that. Sometimes, Ali, you know, he screams in his, in his sleep. Because he used to live in Anuradhapura a long time ago. And they, when he was younger, there were lots of elephants there. So uh, he used to relate stories to me of when he used to go to school. Sometimes they'd have to stop and let the elephants pass. So in your dream world, that is your perception. What makes you think you're not dreaming right now? Why do you think you're not dreaming right now? How do you know? When you're dreaming, do you know you're dreaming? No. Because it's merely a perception. Once you, when you're perceiving something, ladies and gentlemen, that is the truth for you. That is what it is. When you are perceiving something, that is the truth for you, but not necessarily the truth, the absolute truth. These are the conventional truths. We create these conventional realms of existence in every moment that we exist. That's why two people, they can think of each other as husband and wife until they divorce and then from their own, they can quite happily and quite readily not think that the other person is their husband or their wife. How, how is that even possible? That's possible because it's all your perception. Can you not mistake someone for somebody else? So how is that possible? If your friend is in your friend, how can you mistake him for someone else? How can you mistake a stranger to be a friend if the friend is in the friend and the stranger is in the stranger? Neither of these two things are in the stranger or the friend. He says, it's all in your perception. So when you perceive something that is real for you, in your dreams, your dream is real to you. In the same way, right now, you're also dreaming. One day you will realize that. Because you're dreaming, your dream is real to you. So therefore, your son who is sat next to you, you think that is actually your son. But there is nothing about that son that is your son. 
There's nothing about him. All there is is matter and energy. That's all. What part of matter is your son? If matter is your son, then this is also your son. This is also matter. If energy is your son, then light energy is also your son. But you tell me, no, that is not so. But if you take some matter, some energy, bundle it up in a certain way, now you consider them to be your son. How is that? Your dream. That's why they say, Vijnana is like a wizard, is a magician. The Buddha says, Vijnana is like a Maya Karya, is a wizard. He creates all this, he does his wizardry and creates a fantasy world in which you like to live. This hand, your right hand, whose is it? Whose is your right hand? <laughs> whose is your left hand? Yours, right? What makes you think it is yours? Okay, take, take, take your... Ah, yesterday we had a blood donation campaign at the monastery. So we do one every four months. Because there are a lot of people at the monastery, so we are, we are privileged to be able to give blood and as much blood as the blood, can, blood banks can accept. Most days they leave and there's a still a queue waiting <laughs> because we, we, you know, we can give them as much blood as they need. And we're all very healthy and while we have our, our, our health with us, we want to do what we can for society. So yesterday there was a blood donation campaign and we all went and gave, gave blood. Whose blood do you think we gave? My blood, right? So when I gave blood, I gave my blood, right? Yeah? Okay. So, let's say in a month's time, that blood is transfused to someone else. Let's say someone in the audience. Okay, say the gentleman here. He needs blood. Gets taken to the hospital, and then blood is given to the gentleman. Now, is part of me in you, sir? <laughs> it's given to this lady here. Is part of me in you, madam? So then if you are given blood like several times from several people, so who are you then? Then who are you then? What about if you have a kidney transplant? Someone's kidney gets transplanted to you. Now, are you 90% you and 10% somebody else? Or 95% you and 5% kidney somebody else? Then you get a liver transplant. Hmm? That's another 10%. So now you're 80% originally you and 20% somebody else. At what point do you become completely somebody else? Take a car, for instance. Your car, once it starts getting old, parts have to be replaced, right? Yeah, you have to replace parts. So let's say you have an accident and the left door needs to be replaced. Okay? So you take the door out the, the, the door that's, that's been damaged, and you replace it with a second-hand door. They paint it, they, they do the paneling, and they, they fit it, and now it looks like it's all part of the, the original car. So how much of that is actually your car now? Is it 90% your car, 10% somebody else's car? Or do you still feel that it is now all my car? With the new door fitted, Whose car is it now? Still your car. Then the, uh, the other door gets damaged. That also gets replaced by, by the door for another car. Hmm? Then say the bonnet gets damaged. The bonnet gets replaced by another bonnet. The boot gets damaged. That gets replaced by another one. Then the inside, the, up, the, the seats, they get damaged. They get replaced. At what point does it stop being your car? When all parts have been replaced, does that then become your car? You know, every time you take your car to get serviced, what do they do? They take away parts that are yours and then give you other parts, don't they? So every time you take your car to a service, you come back with less of what your car was originally. Don't you? So at what point does it stop being your car? Here's a better question. At what point was it your car to begin with? 
This is the sense of belonging I'm talking to you about. It's only a perception. And it's because of that perception you suffer. Break free from that perception, you will no longer suffer. So how do you break free from that perception? You need to understand what it really is. That is what the Dhamma does for you. It helps you to understand what truly exists in this world. And that is mind or other matter and energy. Anicca, Dukkha and Anatta is to help you understand that. Once you've figured out that there is no part of your car that is your car, it is merely a collection of parts together that manifest. You have broken free from the Sakka Dipti, that view, the view that this all is one entity. And once you are free from Sakkayaditi, you are also free from Vijayakicca, you are also free from Sila Bhatta Paramasa. How that happens, I'll explain to you next week. I just want you all to become Sodapanas, so that you can free yourself from the four great hells. So that you can, you, you, can, you can live the rest of your lives without any fear, without any worry, that something bad, something terrible might happen to you at the moment of your death, because no one's going to be there with you. Please believe me. No one's going to be there with you. All your friends, your best friend, your husband, your wife, your children, your parents, none of them are going to be with you. Besides, what if you get into a coma? You get, a, you, you get into a, a serious accident. They put you in hospital. You're in hospital for three months. People will come up to you, they'll look at you, they'll, they, you know, they'll come to see you, they'll come to see your body. What else can they see? But you're just lying there like a vegetable. People will bring you gifts, but none of it you can use. Right? They'll come and go, they'll, they'll mark their names on the register. I've come to see you, he came to see me, she came to see me. In fact, that's not to please you, that's to please the other people who are around you, your relatives, your relations. That's what they come for, to, 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 to fulfill their duty. Because there's no point in coming to see you now, you're in a coma. <laughs> What's the point of coming to see you now? Don't you agree? You're in a coma, what's the point of coming to see you now? Do you know that they've come? No. They're coming there to fulfill their duty. So, so, you know, so let them. But my point is this. They can't save you now. You only have the Dhamma. Who knows you're going to get back home safely today? How can you tell for sure? How can you tell for sure you're going to get home safely today? Are you, are you going to promise me that you'll all get home unscathed? You're not going to have an accident? And that a container is not going to drive over your vehicle? Hmm? As you drive past Divana, a massive container drives in, right? Hits your, hits your vehicle, you drive straight into the water. By the time the firefighters come, you're dead. They'll save the car, they won't save you. You work 20 years to buy the car. You're still paying the lease. What's left for you? How many things are you still paying leases for? You're paying the mortgage still on the house. You'll work yourself dry until you pay that off. You'll work yourself to the bone paying your mortgage off. I, I feel for you folks. <laughs> That's why I speak to you like this. You'll spend your entire life paying off for your car. That's what you'll do. That's what you'll do. But none of that matters at the end of the day. Because none of your possessions can you take with you. Not a single grain of sand can you take with you. But you spend your entire valuable human life on all that. It's okay. You know, I'm not asking you to stop any of that. If you have to do that, you do that. But what I'm telling you is, there is something far more important that you have to do. Break free from Sakkai Ditti. And do whatever you have to do. How's that for a deal? All I'm asking is to do that, right? I'm not asking for your food. I'm not asking for donations. I'm not asking for anything. All I'm asking is, break free from Sakkai Ditti. One day you will, you, one day you will understand. And if, if we get to that point, I'll explain to you how it is that I can hand on heart and entirely genuinely and with full authenticity. How is it that I actually say these words to you, which is, 
I want nothing from you other than your own salvation. Today you might think, Swami Nivas is just saying that because that's what he has to say. No. I'll explain to you why and how it is I can say that. That I want nothing more than your salvation. I'll say it in a few words in case there are some among you who will understand it already. Once you begin to understand the Dhamma, you realize that it is not my suffering or your suffering that's going on right now. Suffering is suffering. Suffering is suffering. There's no your suffering, my suffering, her suffering, his suffering. There's no such thing. But when suffering happens in the mind, you perceive that you are an entity that suffers. But once you understand the Dhamma, there are no individuals who suffer. Minds suffer. So, if to me, all of these are minds, this is also a mind, this is also a mind, that is also a mind, over at the back of the room is also a mind. And if all minds are equal to me, then does it matter to me which mind I can free from suffering? Does it matter? So then tell me, if I have freed this mind from suffering, but these minds are still suffering, do you think I can be content? If all minds are the same to me, now what do you think I want from you? Your offerings or freedom of each of these minds from suffering? Because I don't think that this is my mind, that is your mind, so therefore all I care about is my freedom from suffering, I don't care whether you suffer. That cannot be true if the Dhamma is true. Because once you realize that Sakkhayadit is only a view, there is no my mind and your mind. These words are so profound. Even I am impressed by their profoundness. <laughs> I don't know how much of this you can actually make sense of. Because I speak to you, having practiced for six long years, and spending the last week contemplating the Dhamma, listening to my teacher, reflecting on the Dhamma, and I come to you and give you a two-hour speech. In that talk, how much of what I'm actually trying to get across to you, you understand? <laughs> I, I honestly have no idea. But I'll keep trying. Whatever I throw at you, I know one thing for certain, you're only catching it at the surface level. There is so much more depth to these words and I'm still actually looking for the right words to express this to you. Once you break free from Sakkai Dipti, once you are able to look outside the world and free of Sakkai Dipti, all minds are the same. Because the mind doesn't belong to anyone. Therefore suffering doesn't belong to anyone. When you have a sense of belonging is when you have a Sakkai Dipti. Here's the last thing, by the way. Now don't come and ask me, Swami Nahasa, did you just say that you have become a Sotapanna? Did you imply that, Swami Nahasa? <laughs> if I wanted to imply that, I wouldn't imply it. I would tell it to you straight. <laughs> what is my Sotapanna of any bearing to you? I'm a Sotapanna. Okay, let's assume I'm a Sotapanna. Are you free from the four great hills? Hmm? So why does it matter to you? <laughs> if the Dhamma is true, and if the Dhamma makes sense, just listen to the Dhamma. Take the Dhamma from here and nothing else. Leave me behind. Leave me to aside. My sotapanna has nothing to do with yours. If you feel that the Swami Nuhansa is not able to deliver the Dhamma in a way that you can become a Sotapanna, then by all means, find someone who can. And I don't mean that in a, in a disrespectful way. Because that is what we should all strive for. Find someone who can help us achieve the noble states, right? And it's not like it's a sin for me to, for me to say whether I'm a Sotapan or not. It's, it's not so. And the Buddha hasn't forbidden me. Or any monk for that matter. To state whether they have achieved a noble state or not. The, the law, the rule that the Buddha laid down was don't reveal them for the sake of your own benefit, your advantage. If when you say such a thing people respect you more and you, because of that you say it, to get that from people for their respect, for their regard, for their offerings, 
for their robes, for their food. Don't go around telling that you have become a Zotapanu, a Sakudago, a Rahatanu Hansi. That is a, is, a, is a transgression which will expel you from the Sasana. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to you what I am. What matters to you is the message that I have brought with me. Does this make sense to you? That's all you've got to think about. And as you listen to this message, do you feel that you are able to free yourself from suffering? If you are, if you, are, if you feel that way, you're in the right place. If you feel that you've been coming along to the sermons, but it's not making sense, and I don't feel like I'm freeing myself from Raga, Dvesha, Moha, then we are probably in the wrong place. Then may your merits guide you to the right place. And once again, I don't say this out of spite. Because you might think, you know, Swami is just having a go at us. <laughs> no. If I was having a go at you or something like that, do you think I'm a Buddha Putra? <laughs> Could I look at the Buddha in his face, lay down in front of him and worship him and then come and start, you know, jesting at you and mocking you? Could I do that? I couldn't. I wouldn't. And I won't. We are all here for one thing. That is salvation. Nibbana and that's all. That is why the name it says is gateway to Nibbana. That's all. Not to the heavens. If you end up in the heavens, then that's your loss. <laughs> I'll say that again. If you end in the heavens, that's your loss. Because you could have reached all the way to Nibbana. <laughs> if you fail this, at least you know, get a complimentary pass <laughs> to, to the heavens. But we are here for Nibbana. Because even in the heavens, they suffer. They have the, the means that they need, they have food, they have shelter, you know, in ways in which we, can even, we can't even imagine. But the mind still suffers. So what's the point of going to the heavens? Is what I ask you. It's better than this, yes. You can live a more comfortable life in the heavens, but if you suffer mentally, what's the point? And it's not like you've not been there before. Plenty times we've been there, even more times we've been there, and now finally we are here, we have noble association, we have the Buddha, we have the Dhamma, so let's strive on and achieve what we have finally been born humans for. Let's end on that note today. Sakkai Ditti. Start to think about what we have discussed today, what Sakkai Ditti means, and how that helps you, that understanding leads to your freeing from Vichikicca and Sila Bada Paramasa as well. We'll talk about next week. Right, let's transfer the merits and bring today's sermon to a close. <clears throat> okay, so first and foremost then, let us all take a moment to remind ourselves how extremely fortunate we are to be in receipt of the Lord Buddha's teaching and with immense gratitude towards the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasikas, let us transfer these merits as they have made great efforts and sacrificed their lives to protect the peace and, beg your pardon, to protect the pristine teachings of the Buddha and passed it down to the generations of the noble lineage in the form of the Tripitaka, which is thankfully available to us today to study and understand and comprehend the Dhamma. Let us also transfer this message to all members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all of the chapters who have dedicated their lives to the noble path and have committed themselves towards the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us also transfer this message to all the monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries who have been by your side through thick and thin, come rain or shine. Let us also transfer this message to my teacher, Guru Swami Nuhanse, as well as all the monks resident at the monastery and the Anagarika and Anagarika communities attached to the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer this message to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by transliterating these talks, sharing them out with others or inviting others to join them. Let us also transfer this message to our devotees and friends of the monastery who, for the sake of merits to help them attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana, continue to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes everyone from those of you who provide for the construction of the monastery to those who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes and medicines, as well as those who pass on their know-how and continue to extend their well wishes. May they all rejoice in these merits. And by the power of these merits, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.
It is also to take a moment to transfer these maids to our mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our friends, our acquaintances, our employers, our employees, and everyone and anyone who spared no effort on our behalf to help us live a comfortable life. May they all rejoice in this medicine by the power of these medicines. May they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to the devas and brahmas, spirits and demons, primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who have committed themselves to protect children and preserving the Sambuddha Sasana, let us transfer these merits to our guardian deities who keep a watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way. May they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits to those who passed away in our name, our loved ones, our forefathers, our ancestors, reminding ourselves that it is in their blood, sweat and tears today we are able to enjoy the comforts of life and also practice the path in peace and harmony. Let us also transfer this message to the members of the armed forces as well as the police force who sacrificed their lives to, to protect the peace and harmony of our nation, as well as those who lost their lives in the, war, in the wars, be they friend or foe. May they all rejoice in these merits. Let us also transfer these merits to those who lost their lives from natural disasters, such as the tsunamis and earthquakes, landslides, fires, floods, as well as the pandemics, reminding ourselves that in this infinitely long journey of sansara, they will all have been mothers and fathers to us, brothers and sisters to us, friends and acquaintances to us. Therefore, out of compassion and loving kindness and an, and an abundance of gratitude towards all of them, let us transfer all these merits to them. By the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And finally, may by the power and blessings of all the merits we have acquired throughout the day, we be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of arahants on this blessed land. And finally, may you and I and everyone who's helped make this program a success become a Rahatan Vahanse or an Arahat Teranin Vahanse in this very life itself and in the era of the Gautama Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all. The members of the Mahasangha will transfer their blessings to you. Raga kinnang midatnva Dvesha kinnang midatnva Moha kinnang midatnva Nibbana parama sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Mamada Sialu Loka Sialu Satnvayo Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Nibbana Parama Sukhayan Sukhita Tara Vetnva Raga Gini Niveva Dvesha Gini Niveva Moha Gini Niveva Nivan Sapa Ladeva Nivan Sapa Ladeva Nivan Sapa Ladeva Tunrangi Susi Ananta Maha Guna Belen Silo Loka Silo Satayoma Nibana Paramasukhain Sukhita Taravetva Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu